Welcome back, everybody. We are preparing for a big storm, or so they say, coming in tomorrow. When I have big storms, I have big problems. We get a lot of I and I at the plant, and so I've got to empty basins and get ready to equalize flow uh, for heavy flows, but um, that's my problem to deal with, not yours. Uh, what we're talking about today is secondary processes. Uh, what you're looking at right now is um, an aeration basin for my membrane bioreactor. I will jump into way more detail about what you're seeing here later in the video. Also across the way is my trickling filter, that big cylinder with the bracing on top. That's the trickling filter. That's another secondary process. I will take you up top there. We'll look at that one and uh, get a little bit more of a, uh, an idea of what goes on there. But let's really quick do a quick overview of all the different biological processes in a wastewater treatment plant. And then we will try to pick each one apart and uh, make sense for you all that are taking your grade one, two, and class C exams. There are four major categories to secondary biological treatment. The first and most basic are ponds. Next, you have biofiltration. This consists of trickling filters and rotating biological contactors. In this process, water passes over a fixed media, and the zugleal mass attached to that media has bacteria in it that consume the waste as it passes by. Lastly, you have suspended media technologies like activated sludge and sequencing batch reactors. These are very similar technologies. The big difference is activated sludge has continuous flow and SBRs are batch processes. Also, the SBR uses equalization, biological reaction, and clarification all in the same tank. Okay, so that rainstorm that they were predicting did show up. Um, you can see my storm retention basin is pretty full, but not overflowing quite yet with rainwater. Um, <clears throat> so in California, I've lived here about 15 years, and I've learned uh, that there are two types of rainstorms in this state. Uh, something that resembles a dense fog and everything all at once. <laughs> so um, anybody who lives in California can also speak to that, I'm sure. So um, anyway, uh, one thing we have to consider, and, and right now the storm, you can see the trees are dancing up there a little bit, but uh, the storm's kind of in a lull. I think we're getting some heavier rain later, but this is a good opportunity to get out and look at stuff. Um, something that, um, excuse my dirty steps and boneyard there, it's kind of a mucky time here at the plant. Um, something I look for is to equalize flow on the secondary processes. And, and what I mean by that is um, what I've done here, these are my secondary sedimentation basins. And you'll see there's a hose, sorry, the camera kind of focused on my finger. There's a hose coming out of that one and going to my uh, sludge pit. Uh, I was draining this basin off uh, the other day to make room for this storm because I've got two issues. One is uh, that's the outfall that goes to the ocean. Uh, it'll back up if flow gets too, um, too extreme and uh, I've got a high tide. There's not enough head to push it out to the, um, the ocean. So what I do is I, I use these secondary sedimentation basins in the winter as flow equalization. And uh, uh, right now, this one I actually got down to 30% capacity. I had a ton of room. So I, I slept like a baby last night, even when the rain was pounding my house because I knew I wasn't going to be, uh, unless there was a real extreme event, I was going to not be so uh, so much called in. Um, so the, the two things you got to think about, I've got that equalization chamber, but also let me run around here and see if I can get a better, oh, there's my beautiful clarifier. Those are patches, by the way, they're not leaks, just in case you're wondering. Um, that's an EQ tank right there, that, that box. So this is equalizing flow to the secondary processes. You got a big concern when it comes to uh, hydraulic loading, and I'll, I'll link to my hydraulic loading rate video at a later time. Um, sorry, not a later time. I'll do a hydraulic loading rate video in the links below. You can go see it. On the secondary processes, when you've got a lot of hydraulic loading, um, on a fixed film reactor like this, where the trickling filter is on, a, on this film that's filling this whole volume here, there's like honeycomb plastic. Uh, it's a trickling filter. It's not a waterfall filter. So uh, when you get heavy hydraulic loading from rainstorms, it'll pass by the uh, media so fast that it'll slough off, know that word sloughing, um, slough off the zugleal mass. That's another key word for trickling filters. And uh, that's the biology that consumes the wastewater and it, it the waste in the water, and it will um, leave your media. And that's a problem. On a membrane bioreactor over here, uh, you'll just overflow. <laughs> there's, no, there's no clarifier. <laughs> Um, but if you have a more conventional activated sludge setup, um, what'll happen is, uh, the clarifier will have so much turbulence in it. It can't settle the sludge and you're going to lose your uh, biomass over the weirs and it'll, it'll discharge into the environment. And that's, that's a big problem. 
Uh, but so just so you know, this does not overflow unless there's a sensor problem because um, all this is run off of uh, level set points. What will end up happening is my EQ pumps just won't, just won't kick on. But uh, it looks like the storm might be kicking up a little bit more, so I'm going to stop it here. Just wanted to give you a quick discussion about why you need to uh, watch your hydraulic loading rate in a storm like this um, because it can be detrimental for weeks if you wash out your biology. All right, let's go to the next segment. All right, let's do a 30,000 foot view of the secondary processes. I'm going to try to stay out of nutrient removal. Uh, and when I say that, I mean nit nitrogen and phosphorus um, because you don't really need to know that for the early exams. But I'm going to throw a bone to the higher level folks and I will touch on it briefly uh, in each process and kind of tell you what you can expect from each process. But I'm not going to dive into it. We'll, we're going to do separate videos on all that um, at a later time. So, um, Ponds, biofiltration, activated sludge, and sequencing batch reactors are the four biological processes that the California State Water Resources Control Board uses to classify a plant, to give it its level of certification needed and, um, and all that. So let's kind of break this down and talk about each one. First, you have ponds. Um, they are going to be classified as either facultative, aerobic, or anaerobic. Facultative are going to be the most common because they're the ones that mimic nature the most. You can rely on the wind to aerate the top or, you know, sunlight and algae to aerate the top. And then you'll have an uh, anaerobic layer on the bottom. These are stratified ponds, typically 9 to 12 feet deep. Um, and they're just easier to manage because it's the most likely that you're the thing you're most likely to run into uh, in the real world in nature. Uh, and they're very good at actually removing BOD and TSS when they're when they're well run. And um, if you actually have an aerobic uh, uh, pond further downstream after the BOD is removed, uh, you, you could even nitrify um, and get rid of your ammonia and turn it to nitrates. Um, but, but one thing that's really difficult with ponds is, is total nitrogen removal. And so that I'm just going to touch on, on that briefly. That's a big drawback for ponds, especially in California with our new regulations about nutrient removal. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a different video. Uh, one of the drawbacks for ponds is that it requires a lot of acreage. You know, and we're in California out here, land is not cheap. So you're going to see these in rural areas that are, uh, that have uh, a lot of land that's, that's cheaper, but even, I mean, very, there's very few places in California anymore that somebody goes, oh yeah, let me, let me buy several acres so I can dig up a big hole and put, put a pond in. Uh, it's typically going to be, uh, if newer plants are going in, it's going to be, um, activated sludge plants because they're, they're just. They're just way more versatile, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Now, the plus side of ponds is that they're easy to run, and I'm not taking away anything from the people that operate ponds, but they are the least technical of the, of the many things that we do here. Uh, the one thing I will say, though, is when they go sideways, either through a you know, plant upset that's you know, not your fault or a plant upset that you know, you, you maybe we're taking some stuff for granted and it kind of turned on you, uh, they are very difficult to get to rain back in. So you want to just stay on top of of your processes in a pond. Uh, the other thing is they're cheap to run, especially facultative ponds, because we, you rely on natural elements, uh, wildlife, the sun, uh, wind. Uh, they're, they're just, you, you paid up front for your land, but you don't pay a lot of mechanical costs. Um, and I, I call it the most basic form of treatment because it's the one you have the least ability to do enhanced biological nutrient removal on. And um, there, I just feel like it's the easiest to run. And I have worked in pond systems, uh, facultative and aerobic. I've never worked in an anaerobic pond system, um, but I, I have experience. Uh, and, and one of the pond systems I worked in actually had um, uh, membrane filtration tertiary treatment. We, uh, we did reclaim Title 22, uh, reclaimed water for irrigation. So the next type of, class, of category is biofiltration. This is going to be your trickling filters and your rotating biological contactors. These are aerobic processes. And the thing you need to know about these is they have something called zuglial mass. That's the bacterial film that grows on the, uh, the media, whatever it is, honeycombs, rocks, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different media that they use in these things. And uh, that, as the water passes by, that zuglial mass uh, consumes the waste. And we'll get into more of that. That's just a buzzword you should know. And uh, there's some, some nutrient removals possible if you're, if you're, really strategic. I listened to a lecture once about a guy who allowed um, some overgrowth on one of the parts of his trickling filter, and that created an anoxic zone. 
and um, good for him. That that sounds like a level of complexity I'm not interested in getting into <laughs> unless I have to. But uh, that was really cool that they were able to do that. So some nutrient removal is possible. Uh, I, on my trickling filter, partially nitrify, which is, you know, in the summertime can be very dubious. And I'll explain why that's a problem. Uh, if you're going to nitrify, you just need to do it and, and go for all of it. Uh, but uh, um, partial nitrification can be a real drag. <clears throat> again, back out of the weeds. Let's get into uh, the 30,000 foot view again. Trickling filters and RBCs, I already told you, those are the um, things that we're going to use here. It's a fixed media, like I already said. Uh, less land area than ponds, more operator involvement. So uh, you're, you're, there's more process controls. You have to pay a little bit more attention to your organic and your hydraulic loading rates um, because when these plants get upset, they can, they can lash out at you very, very fast. But in my experience, they're easier to rein back in than a pond if it gets kind of out of whack on you. And you're going to have a moderate cost on these. Uh, you don't have the blower costs of an activated sludge plant, but you're going to have more mechanical costs, more operators involved, uh, than what, than on a pond system. You know, there's more pumps for the most part in these plants, uh, lift stations and things like that. Um, okay. So now you have activated sludge. This is the most common globally. Uh, it is the most effective at BOD and TSS reduction, and it is the most versatile. Um, you're going to have in these, you're gonna have aerobic anoxic and anaerobic zones. And so I'm going to toss the grade three, four, and fives at bone here and the class A's and B's BOD and TSS reduction and nitrification denitrification, so nitrogen removal, not just conversion, and then phosphorus removal for anaerobic zones. We'll talk about all that at a later time. Um, so in ponds, you have facultative aerobic or anaerobic bacteria. In biofiltration, you've got zooglial mass. In activated sludge, we refer to it as the MLVSS, the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. This is synonymous with the amount of uh, or microorganisms in there consuming the waste. And MLSS, which is the actual mixed liquor suspended solids. If you go back and look at the beginning of the video, you'll see I'm standing at an aeration basin. It's churning up. And there's um, that is what we call the mixed liquor suspended solids. And the percentage of it that can that is volatile are the microorganisms. We'll get into that more um, when we get into activated sludge. And I promised I'd let you know a little bit more about what was going on. For those of you who are a little bit more experienced, you saw some foaming on my aeration basin. I run a very high MCRT. I run a very low F to M and I run a very high MLSS, somewhere around 8,500 milligrams per liter, plus or minus a thousand. So I get, I get like 95% nitrogen removal because I have an anoxic zone. I'll get into that later, but that's why you saw foam. When you get into those higher uh, uh, sludge retention rates or whatever metric sludge age, whatever metric you use, um, you're going to get stuff like that. And you just kind of have to, you know, make sure it doesn't get out of control and foam over. Uh, but we'll get, Back in the weeds. Let me get back into the 30,000 foot airplane here. Uh, you have less space than ponds, way less space, especially with something like an MBR. It's more condensed. Uh, best removal percentages, like I already said. The most expensive. This is where you get into blower costs. These blowers are running all the time. They're expensive to run. You got a lot of mechanics. There's more moving parts that can break. Um, and uh, so power and labor are the two most expensive things you have to run. Grade fours and fives, know that. Um, the, the most expensive thing at a plant is labor and power, but they're the most versatile. You can do a lot of cool stuff with it. And there are several variations. So if you don't see your oxidation ditch up here, that's a form of activated sludge. If you don't see your extended aeration, activated sludge. If you don't see your pure oxygen, that's activated sludge. Um, and also the, there's not only all these many offshoots of activated sludge, but there's different ways that the, it can actually, um, you know, enter the basin. So you've got step feed, you've got complete mix, you've got um, plug flow. This is advanced, the grade threes, fours and fives and, and class Bs and class As, pay attention to what I just said there. Grades one and two, um, you don't need to know all of that stuff. Now you do need to know about oxidation ditches and extended aeration, um, but I didn't see contact stabilization and re-aeration re until I think my grade four, maybe my three, but um, yeah, just trying to give you an idea what, what you might see on each test. But there's several variations of activated sludge. And then you have sequencing batch reactors. Um, this is almost the same exact technology of activated sludge. And I'd almost say they should be under the same umbrella. But the biggest difference in SBRs is that they are timed batches versus continuous flow. So something I should have probably written on here is WAS and RAS, waste activated sludge and, and return activated sludge. 
in an activated sludge plant, you have a constant return moving back to the front of the plant or the front of our aeration, whatever you're doing, where that return is going to. And you've got this constant movement happening and with a constant effluent stream. With sequencing batch reactors, it's, it's different where you've got a basin that, that the flow equalizes and then it does its batching it, or its, its biological reaction with the, with the aerating and all the things it does. And then it settles. It's its own clarifier, uh, the, the aeration basin in essence, and then it decants. But I would say um, the one threat here is that you can have big spills because it's got nowhere to go. Um, the worst thing that's going to happen in an activated sludge plant, as long as you're managing your MLSS, you might have a bi biomass washout, but it's not going to be anything like an SBR spill because um, if it doesn't have time to settle, it's, it, can, it can get gnarly. So um, that's been my experience anyway. And I, like I said, I've worked in all four of these categories, uh, but this is the one I have the least experience with. So operators that have SBR experience, please put in the comments below, share your experience. Um, I, I'd love to hear about it, but I, I just, I don't know if I told you this or not, but in case I'm repeating myself, I'll do it anyway. Um, I've worked in facultative ponds with aerobic ponds. Um, I've worked in RBC plants, trickling filter plants. Um, I've worked in conventional activated sludge, extended aeration, and I've worked in, um, now, right now, I'm working in a membrane bioreactor uh, plant, and I've also worked in sequencing batch reactors, but these were small industrial plants. These weren't large scale plants. And um, yeah, so I just, I just want to give you an idea of my experience, and I, I do have a little bit of authority when it comes to talking about these different processes. I'm not just pulling this out of a book. I'm, I'm trying to give you some real world experience, um, and this is my point of view on the four categories. Okay, I'm done rambling on to you. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you have any questions, put it in the comments below. I know that was a lot, but like I said, each one of these categories deserves its own video. And, and I mean, this one's probably going to be a five or six video series. There's so much that you can do with activated sludge. Okay, I'm done rambling. Again, please ask questions. All right, now we're cooking. The storm's really starting to show up. Uh, this camera's not doing a really good job catching it, but we got some decent rain. Um, I looked at the radar. We've got some pretty torrential sheets heading our way. Uh, it, it, we're just now, it looks like, going down uh, into drainage. The storm retention basin starting to discharge uh, two stormwater uh, culverts down, downstream. But uh, anyway, yeah, so I'm going to wrap it up, focus on what I need to focus on here at the plant uh, during this storm. If you got anything of value out of this, please uh, like and subscribe. Uh, please put down in the comments below if there's a video you want me to do. Uh, somebody asked about a DAF unit. So um, I haven't worked on a dissolved air flotation unit in about 10 years, nine, 10 years. So I need to do a little research, put together something uh, uh, you know, solid for you guys, shake the rust off when it comes to that. Uh, but I am working on things like that. So if you have any questions about something you wanna see, please. Uh, put it in the comments below or message me on LinkedIn. My profile is linked in the, in the links below. If you're out in weather like this, doing anything, operating, driving, walking, uh, I saw a jogger out while I was coming into work, tree branches fall, please be safe. Uh, keep your eyes open for hazards. Uh, this, is when, this is when bad things happen. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys have a great day and I will see you in the next video.